Hi, hello and welcome back to F1 Challenge VB. My name is Mephisto and our journey through the history of Formula 1 continues today with the opening round of the 1960 season, the Argentine Grand Prix. But before we begin, as always I'd like to thank everyone who took part in the straw poll. It's nice to see that there are so many people interested in this series. I'd also like to thank everyone else who's watching these videos. It really helps a lot. Now, let's take a look at the poll results. First off, there were a total of 70 votes sent in, and it breaks down as follows. Scuderia Centrasud received 2 votes, Scarab F1 and Yeoman Credit Racing both received 3 votes each, Owen Racing Organization and Rob Walker Racing Team received 4 votes each, Equipe Nationale Belgae, Team Lotus and Cooper Car Company have 5 votes each, making them the 3rd most voted teams. The second most voted team was Ferrari with 17 votes, but the winning team is Aston Martin with a total of 23 votes. So that is the team Andy will be driving for this season. Once again, thank you for taking the time to vote and thank you for taking the time to watch these videos. It makes all of the time I put into these videos worthwhile. So thank you all so very much. One last thing before we take a look at the season overview, I will be reintroducing pit stops starting this season. Well, sort of. Let me explain. Most of the circuits, at least these early ones, have a bug that's preventing the AI from pitting properly, and what ends up happening is the AI simply goes into the pits and retires. At such circuits, only I will make pit stops. There are however a number of circuits where the pits work as they should, so at those tracks, pit stops will be enabled for everyone. And there are a few more circuits where not even I can make pit stops because the pit crew simply doesn't spawn in. Now keep in mind that just because I'm going to enable pit stops doesn't necessarily mean that the AI will stop. And that's fine because pit stops back in the 50s and 60s and even most of the 70s wasn't really a thing. Most of these cars have large enough fuel tanks to carry them all the way to the end and changing tires wasn't a thing either because, well, the, the tire compounds they used back then were good enough to work for 2, 3, 4 races at a time. So in short, pit stops are back at least to some degree. Anyway, let's move on and talk a little bit about the 1960 season. And before we take a look at the season results, I'd like to mention that there's been a pretty big rule change in 1960. At first glance, it doesn't look like much, but it did have a big impact overall. So what is this change and what did it affect? The change has to do with the scoring system. Up until now, points were awarded to the top 5 finishers in a race with 8, 6, 4, 3 and 2 points respectively. Besides this, 1 point was awarded to the person who posted the fastest lap of the race. However, this is no longer the case. Starting in 1960, the point for the fastest lap was dropped, and instead the top 6 race finishers were awarded points as follows. 8 for the winner, 6 for 2nd place, 4 for 3rd, 3 for 4th, 2 for 5th, and 1 for 6th. Again, this doesn't sound like much but it does have a huge impact on the championship in the long run. With that out of the way, let's see what happened in the 1960 Formula 1 season. The season started on the 7th of February and ended on the 20th of November. It was made up of 15 races in total, 10 championship races and 5 non-championship events. Now let's see how the driver's championship played out. Moss finished the season in third with 19 points, winning just 2 of the 10 races. McLaren finished in second with 34 points, or 37 if we are to count the dropped points. But the winner of the driver's championship was Jack Brabham who scored a total of 43 points, winning 5 of the available 10 races. Next let's look at the constructors. Ferrari ended the season in third with 26 points, or 27 if we are to consider the dropped points. Lotus finished in 2nd with 34 points, 37 with the drop points, and the winning team was Cooper, they scored a total of 48 points, 58 if we consider the dropped points. And they did this by pretty much dominating the season by winning 6 of the 10 races, and earning maximum points in doing so. Lastly, 1960 would turn out to be yet another tragic season. 3 people lost their lives during this season, Harry Shell was the first to lose his life during the BRDC Trophy, a non-championship race held at Silverstone. The other 2 drivers lost their lives during the Belgian 
Grand Prix at Spa. They were Chris Bristow and Alan Stacey. With that said, it's time we take a look at the opening round of the 1960 season and that is the Argentine Grand Prix. It was held on the 7th of February, it had 25 entries, 22 of them took part in the race and 8 of them ended up retiring. The race consisted of 80 laps completed in 2 hours, 17 minutes and 49 seconds. Moss started the race from pole with Ireland in 2nd, Graham Hill 3rd, Bonnier 4th, Von Trips 5th and Phil Hill started from 6th. Bruce McLaren drove a fantastic race to win the Argentine Grand Prix, Allison finished in 2nd, 26.3 seconds later, Trintignant shared his car with Moss who finished in 3rd, he was 36.9 seconds behind, Mendita Goy finished in 4th, 53.3 seconds behind, Von Trips crossed the line in 5th, he was 1 lap down, and the last person to score points was Innes Ireland, he was also 1 lap down. Sterling Moss managed to post the fastest lap of the race, a 1 minute 30 8.9 second lap. We return to Argentina after a short break where a lap starts off with a long run down into turn 1, a long open right hander. Pay attention as the corner tightens towards the exit. Next we come into turn 2, a fast right hander. Be very careful through here as there is a small hill at the corner exit and this could launch you into the air causing you to miss turn 3, a tight right hand hairpin, which is immediately followed by a left right chicane and then a double apex left hander. Take it easy on the exit of the second left hander as it is easy to spin the car through here. We then come into a high speed left right chicane. Make sure to slow down a bit for the right hander or you could find yourself going off the track and losing precious time. Next we have another right hand hairpin. There is a nasty bump right on the apex which can very easily unsettle the car, so be very careful. We then come through the final corner of the track, a fast left hander that brings us back onto the main street and that is a lap around the Buenos Aires circuit. And here we are at the Buenos Aires circuit coming around to set our first and only qualifying lap a 136.159 and the reason I didn't try to do any better be is because I felt very confident we I we qualified in second already so I don't think we'll lose too much place too many places at least that's what I was hoping for anyway these are the previous Argentine Grand Prix winners we managed to win once or twice, so that's pretty nice. But anyway, here is the grid lineup, and we have Bruce McLaren on first, Olivia Gendebi in second, Tony Brooks third, fourth is Ines Ireland, Andy Higgs in fifth. So we did qualify quite well, and rounding off the top six is Lu Lucien Bianchi. Henry Taylor is seventh, Sterling Moss eighth, Jack Brabham ninth, Graham Hill qualified tenth, eleventh is Joe Bonnier, followed by Dan Gurney in twelfth. Maurice Trintignant is 14th, 14th is Wolfgang von Trips, 15th is Richie Ginter, 16th is Chuck Day, Willie Marys is 17th, 18th Ron Flockhart, Jim Clark 19th, Phil Hill 20th, and bringing up the rear we have John Surtees and Cliff Allison 21st and 22nd. So that's the grid lineup for the 1960 Argentine Grand Prix. We start from fifth, which is quite impressive. We haven't started from this high up the field in a very, very long time. And we are up for the Argentine Grand Prix. Uh, a lot of wheel spin on my end, and that causes me to lose a bunch of positions. We are already down in 10th as we race towards turn one here. Uh, pull back a little bit because I want to avoid a turn one carnage and I don't quite manage to because I crash into Gandebia's Yeoman credit racing there and that kind of holds me up so we now fall down into 18th no 19th as Phil Hill passes us in his Ferrari so that that was quite a bad bad start for us hopefully we can uh, recover soon enough but here is another replay of the start Again, a lot of wheel spin right off the start there, which caused me to lose a bunch of positions, which is not ideal, obviously. Again, I'm hoping that I'll be able to pull back the gap and kind of climb my way back up into fifth if possible. And that was the incident with Gandebian in the Yeoman as we now come through this left hander here and we pass Phil Hill for 18th chasing after John Surtees now who is just 
about six, uh, five tenths of a second up the road and we close the gap as we come out of the um, chicane however he's much faster and then towards the end of the lap as we come through the final uh, hairpin well the second hairpin both Phil Hill and Cliff Allison managed to overtake me so I fall down to 20th which is not quite I not very good but then as we come into turn one on lap two I managed to overtake Gandebian and now I'm challenging Harry Taylor Henry Taylor even and then Cliff Allison for 17th so quite a good battle on the first few laps here as we take a look at a replay of Phil Hill who loses control of his Ferrari hits one of the Yaman Credit racing cars and for some reason decides to uh, retire not quite sure what happened there but then as we come around to finish towards the end of lap 2 I once again lose a position to Henry Taylor coming out of the final corner but it looks like I have much better drive than him and uh, overtake him and John Sturdy's for 15th as we now take a look at a replay of Cliff Allison who is coming into the pits to retire his Ferrari not entirely sure why but there he is he came into the pits and that is the end of his race and this is a replay of Graham Hill who does pretty much the same thing we see him being uh, raised up on the jacks for a tire change and he, he he's let free but he doesn't go anywhere I'm not entirely sure what's happening uh, and that's it that's pretty much it for his race as we now move on to lap 3 we are in 15th chasing after Ronald Flockhart who is right in front of us in his Lotus he has a very good he's much much faster out of that corner actually most of the cars have better acceleration out of corners than we do but eventually on lap 4 I managed to overtake Ronald Flockhart for 14th now chasing after Jim Clark with 1.5 seconds up the road lap 5 and I close in the gap on Jim Clark although not by much as again most of the cars seem to have much better acceleration than I do as we take a look at a replay of Willie Maryse who loses control of his Ferrari coming into turn 1 here and decides to retire for some reason as we see a Yeoman credit racing kind of going past there then on lap 6 I almost crashed into Jim Clark there coming up coming out of the hill almost landed on top of Jim Clark thankfully we didn't do it as we come through the chicane here trying to find a way around Jim Clark but he is kind of driving very, very well and holding me back and then he decides to drive into me coming out of the left hander and unfortunately I hit him and flip him upside down so that's the end of his race as we take a look at a replay of Lucien Bianchi who loses control of his car and then gets stuck on a tree because that's what you do I think and here is a, the replay of myself oh, of Jim Clark we come through the double apex right hander he turns in on me I have no idea why he was trying to I don't know I have no idea why he was trying to defend at that point uh, I pretty much had the racing line so whatever as we move on towards the end of lap 6 uh, challenging Ronald Flockhart for 11th there not really successfully he manages to stay in 11th for the time being however as we start lap 7 he's very slow through this through turn 1 and we manage to eventually snag, snag his position and we're now chasing after Dan Gurney who is 1.3 seconds up the road who eventually loses control of his car uh, causes me to go wide and lose a position to Ron Flockhart so I will we'll try to keep as close as possible hopefully they'll make another mistake and coming through turn 1 both Flockhart and Gurney are very slow through the corner and I managed to move up into 10th which is well quite nice I would say this is lap 8 and uh, halfway through lap 8 I'm trying to challenge Von Trips who loses control of his car through this double apex left hander I clip him not I hit him not intentionally obviously but uh, I managed to get in front of him 
Unfortunately, the, after this, he decided to retire. Well, actually, this is what's happening. He kind of drives around and into that podium there, or rather, a uh, camera stand. Uh, and he retires as I'm now challenging Chuck Day for position for eighth. And after a pretty tough battle there, uh, well, not tough, but a sus suspenseful battle through the hairpin, we, I managed to snag eighth place. Then we move up into seventh, now sixth, and we are in the points as we are now chasing after Tony Brooks, who is 18 seconds up the road. Not sure if I can catch him, but we now move on to lap 17th, and we challenge Brooks for position we move up into 50 drops to 6 which is absolutely amazing next we'll have to somehow find Sterling Moss and here we are on lap 19 coming around to set the fastest lap of the race uh, which is um, well quite good and then on lap 20th I'm coming in for for my pit stop and as you can see the lap counter didn't switch over so this is quite um, interesting and you'll see something even more interesting in a little bit as I kind of mi miss my pit crew here. That was kind of embarrassing but uh, yes the lap counter should have should now show 21. So I'm not quite sure what's happening there and in, in a second here you'll see something even more interesting. Tony Brooks is around 5 seconds behind me and all of a sudden a lot of people overtake me and I'm suddenly in 14th. I'm not quite sure what happened there. Well, I kind of know. Because the lap counter didn't switch over, I'm now one lap behind. Because that's a thing, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I don't really have any words for that. Anyway, we move on to lap 21st and Richie Ginther is now out of the Argentine Grand Prix and we see a replay of him right now as he comes through turn 1 here. He loses control of his Ferrari, flips it upside down, then gets collected by a uh, Scuderia Centro suit car and that's the end of his race. As we now come around to finish lap 26 and start 27, a bunch of cars were in the pits, went in to kind of retire. However, from here on out, everyone who retires actually managed to complete 90% of race distance, so they are pretty much in the race. First we saw... Uh, John Surtees, this is Joe Bonnier uh, coming into the pits. Again, they've completed 90% of race distance, so they will classify as race finishers. This is Dan Gurney coming into the pits for whatever reason he wants to come into. This is Chuck Day in the Scarab F1 who runs out of fuel and, well, that's the end of his race. Again, he's well within 90% race of race distance and that was Maurice Trintignant running out of fuel right on right before the final corner and we, as we now start the final lap of the race and we move up into 6th even 5th once we pass Sterling Moss or where Sterling Moss uh, retired this is uh, Henry Taylor stopping in, on the uh, hairpin there we all now then saw Innes Ireland, this is, and now this is Ronald Flockhart coming into the pits, as well as Maurice Trintignant in the Scuderia Centro Sud who retires. Then we have Sterling Moss who runs out of fuel, and finally Bruce McLaren who also runs out of fuel. Again, these last few, these last people who we saw, actually completed 90% of race distance, so they will classify as race finishers as we now come around to finish the race in fourth and here are the race results again and once again I know I've repeated myself a hundred times now but uh, even though a lot of people are kind of retired they did finish 90% of race distance so I, I in my opinion they should uh, count as uh, race finishers and we also see the retirement here from Ginther all the way down to Phil Hill who was the first person to retire.
So that was the uh, Argentine Grand Prix, quite interesting, especially there towards the end, and I kind of know what happened. Well, first you saw that my lap counter kind of went haywire when I went into the pits. Second, uh, the algorithm that calculates fuel consumption is quite broken on this circuit, so I'm guessing that's what happened, and that's why a lot of people ran out of fuel on the final lap. But anyway, here are the career statistics, and this was Andy's 86th Grand Prix. His best start is from first, has 4 pole positions, has set 15 fastest laps, his best finishes in first, has completed 61 races, 53 of them in the points, has won 32 Grand Prix, 4 at the Indianapolis 500, 5 in Monaco, has 7 championships under his belt, has scored a total of 361 points, has retired 25 times, has experienced 1984 out of 2387 laps, has 6 bronze trophies, 9 silver trophies, 32 gold trophies and as an extension 32 podiums. And here is a very quick look at the championship standings. Brabham takes the lead of the Drivers' Championship with Tony Brooks in second, Gendebian third, Hicks fourth, Bruce McLaren fifth, and Sterling Moss sixth. And at the very, very bottom we see Phil Hill. So that's pretty much it for the driver standings. Again, this is the millionth time I'm repeating this, but everyone from Trintignant all the way to 30s retired after completing 90% of race distance, so I see no real reason to actually note them as retirements or DNFs. But anyway, let's move on to the constructors. Here are the standings for the constructors championship. Cooper take the lead of this championship. Yoman Credit Racing are in second, Aston Martin third, and Rob Walker Racing Team are in fourth. So that's pretty much it for the constructors, not much to talk about here. But anyway, that was the opening round of the 1960 season, the Argentine Grand Prix. To some extent, it was a successful race, I would say, a better race than what we generally see, although we had that little kind of weird thing towards the end of the race on the final two laps. Again, uh, that's mainly due to the fact that the fuel consumption algorithm for this particular track is kind of off, but yeah. Anyway, our next race is the Monaco Grand Prix, which is going to be the true test to see how well the AI fares. Uh, I'm not sure what to say. Uh, I can already see pretty much everyone retiring from the Monaco Grand Prix, so... I hope I'm wrong. I really, really hope I'm wrong. But anyway, that is the end of the Argentine Grand Prix, the end of this video. Again, a pretty interesting race, especially towards the end, but hopefully this is a sign of what we can expect expect from this season. I would very much appreciate it if things would turn out the way they did today, because I actually had quite a bit of fun racing today. Uh, I There was a bit of challenge there, so I wasn't just overtaking everyone after just two or three corners, so I had to fight for my position even though 4th place was pretty much given to me on the final 2 laps. But yeah, that is the end of this video. You can already vote for next season's team. There is a link in the description that will take you to a straw poll where you can do so, so make sure to check it in the description box below. It will be the first link. I also have a second channel where I will be playing all sorts of different games. At the moment I'm doing a playthrough of Diablo 2 and uh, IL-2 Sturmovic 1946, so if you're interested in any of that, there will be a link in the description to that as well. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, thank you all so much for watching, and as always, stay sharp!